And we're talking about a five by three contingency table, then it has and that's the table that has five rows and three columns. And then the cell value C two sub one, uh, C sub two comma one is the row two column one entry of the uh, table. The row two column one entry. So like if you see uh, this right here, this means that it's the row two, row four, excuse me, the row four column two entry. That's what that notation means here. Okay. So the idea is that if we want to uh, test for independence versus dependence between two categorical variables, uh, we like to conduct what's called a tight squared test of independence. Notice that word CHI is not pronounced as chai or chi. It is pronounced as chi. So it's a, it's a hard K sound. Okay. This will be our test statistic. And uh, this looks awfully familiar. Where did we see this before? Where did where and when did we see that? That looks awfully familiar. It's the goodness of fit test. Wasn't that the test the statistic for the chi-square goodness of fit test? Same thing, wasn't it? So the test statistic is the same between that test of last week and this test uh, this afternoon. Uh, as before, O represents the observed frequency. E represents the expected frequency under the, no, under the assumption that the null hypothesis is true. Okay, and so what we're going to do is we're going to you know, uh, sum up the squared differences between the observed and the expected frequencies divided by the expected frequencies. This um, statistic um, can be shown by theoretical statistics to be distributed according to the continuous uh, positively skewed probability distribution called the chi-square distribution, of which we seen a picture of last week when doing the goodness of fit test. Now, as I'm, the number of degrees of freedom is going to be a little bit different than it was last week. Last week, it was the number of categories minus one. But now, the degrees of freedom for this chi-square goodness of fit test is going to be um, the number of rows minus one times the number of columns minus one. So notice the degrees of freedom changes from the goodness of fit test last week to the, uh, the, the test of independence uh, today. So be careful of the degrees of freedom. So again, the degrees of freedom is equal to the number of rows minus one, the number of rows that your contingency uh, table has, minus one times the number of columns your table has, minus one. That's the degrees of freedom you take to the chi-square um, table, okay, to find the critical uh, chi-square value when conducting the test the um, uh, critical value method way. All right, now, to use the chi-square independence test, the data must come from a random sample, and the expected value in each cell must be five or more. So um, in all the cells of your table, your contingency table, your expected values need to be at least five. If the expected value is in the cell is less than five, you need to combine categories. Now, the null hypothesis the null hypothesis is that the variables are independent. And the alternative hypothesis is the hypothesis or the statement that says the variables are dependent. Okay. Um, so in general, what happens is if your test statistic is large, then that means there is a um, 
there is a rather large difference between the observed and the expected frequencies. Uh, if that's the case, uh, that uh, then your test statistic tends to be pushed into the upper tail rejection region of the chi-square distribution, which lends, lends credence to the fact that your um, categorical um, variables being tested are dependent upon one another. Okay. Now, the expected value of each cell in the continuous table is the value that would occur if the two variables used to generate the table were independent, if the two categorical variables are independent. And therefore, the expected value um, is going to be computed by taking the row sum and multiplying it by the column sum and then dividing that by the grand sum, grand total. Okay. So that is going to be uh, how we're going to compute expected values. Again, taking the row total times the column total divided by the grand total. All right. <laughs> All right, here's a good example to illustrate the chi-square test of independence. A new post-operative procedure is administered to a number of patients at a large hospital. The researcher wants to know if the doctors feel differently from the nurses about the procedure or do they basically feel the same way? A random sample of doctors and nurses results in the following data. Notice our rows of our table uh, represent the nurses versus doctors and the columns represent uh, whether the new procedure is preferred or um, the old procedure is preferred or if there is um, no opinion either way, no preference. And so they surveyed a bunch of doctors and nurses randomly, and these were their responses. Okay, 100 nurses preferred the new procedure, um, whereas only 50 doctors preferred the new procedure. Um, so do we understand what these numbers represent in this table here? It's basically um, where these nurses and doctors fall as far as their opinion is concerned. Here, so we have two rows by three columns. So this is a two by three, a two by three contingency table, two rows by three columns. And so there are six cells, right? This is the one one cell. This is the this is the row one column one cell. This is the row one column two cell. This is the row one column three cell. This is the row two column one cell, the row two column two cell, and the row two column three cell. Our hypothesis that we'll be testing is the null hypothesis states that the opinion is independent of the profession. So we have two categorical variables, profession, whether you're a nurse or a doctor, and uh, the opinion category, categorical variable, which is prefer the new procedure, prefer the old procedure, or no preference. So we want to see if these two categorical variables are dependent or independent of each other. And so therefore, we will conduct a chi-square test of independence. The alternative hypothesis says the opinion and dependent the opinion is dependent on the profession. <clears throat> All right, so therefore, the question is not about whether uh, one group prefers a procedure uh, and the other doesn't. We're not able to test for that. We are testing, ladies and gentlemen, just to see if the proportion of nurses with each opinion is the same as the proportion of doctors with that particular opinion. Okay. So chi-square test of independence. All right, so the next step now is we're going to have to uh, compute our test statistic and uh, determine our rejection acceptance region here. And let's see if they do that there. 
All right, so we're going to test at 5% level of significance, and there's two rows and three columns. Therefore, we're going to have uh, 2 minus 1 times 3 minus 1, or 2 degrees of freedom. And therefore, if we take to the chi-square uh, table uh, with 2 degrees of freedom, 5%, uh, we'll discover that our critical chi-square variant is 5.991. And uh, I think I showed you this table uh, last week. But it uh, uh, just to remind ourselves, it does hang out in the appendix uh, at the back of our textbook. It is the um, table A-6 right here. We're testing at 5%, so that's the size of our upper tail rejection region, and we have two degrees of freedom. And therefore, you can see that 5.991 is our critical chi-square variant. Two degrees of freedom. 0 0.05 level of significance we're testing at. That's the uh, area of the upper tail rejection region. All right, so that's how they got to that. Okay. All right, now, uh, what we need to do is we need to take this two by three table and uh, add some uh, column totals to it and some row totals. And of course, we have a grand total, which is 400 here. So 400 um, professionals were randomly surveyed nurses and doctors and these are their, their frequency responses falling in each cell now we need to compute the six expected frequencies one for each cell so under the null hypothesis if the null hypothesis is true we would expect uh, about 75 okay nurses to prefer the new procedure and how do we get that? Well, to compute the one one expected uh, frequency, the row one column one expected frequency, we take the row one total, which is 200, and we multiply it by the column one total, which is 150. And then we divide that product by the grand total of 400. And we get 75. Now to compute the one two expected frequency, under the null hypothesis, if it was true, we would expect 100 nurses to prefer the old procedure. How did we get that? We took the row one total of 200, multiplied it by the column two total of 200, and divided by the grand total of 400. We get 100. The one three expected frequency is found by taking row one total 200 times the column three total, which is 50, divided by 400. That gives us 25. The 2 1 expected frequency is 75, found by taking the row 2 total times the column 1 total. So 200 times 150 divided by 400 gives you 75. The 2 2 expected frequency is 100, and the 2 3 expected frequency is 25. Do we understand how we computed these six expected frequencies, one for each cell? So we have our observed frequencies, which are in the table, versus our expected frequencies uh, under the assumption that the null hypothesis is true. And we're going to look at the difference, essentially the difference between those two, the observed and the expected frequencies, to see if there is uh, evidence to suggest that there is independence or dependence between these two categorical variables. Oftentimes, it is... Um, the case where we put the expected frequencies inside parentheses next to the observed frequency in each cell. Uh, this is a nice way to see um, what kind of difference exists for each of the, um, the particular uh, cell results here. To compute our test statistic, we take the observed frequency, subtract off the expected frequency, square that difference, and divide by the expected frequency. So we're going to have 100 minus 75 quantity squared divided by 75. 
plus 80 minus 100, quantity squared divided by 100, plus 20 minus 25, quantity squared divided by 25, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is your test statistic down here, which comes out to be about almost 27. So that's your test statistic, about 26.667. All right, now we're going to compare our test statistic versus our critical chi-square value to see in what region our test statistic falls, whether it falls in the acceptance or the rejection region. And, ladies and gentlemen, we can see that our test statistic falls very, very, very safely way up here in the upper tail rejection region. It is extremely far away from the critical chi-square value of 5.991. So this is an extremely conclusive test to conclude that we would definitely reject the null hypothesis and not even have to worry about a type one error. So this is a very conclusive test to say that there is dependence uh, between the profession uh, of a medical uh, person versus uh, their preference as to this uh, new uh, medical procedure versus the old one. There is a strong dependence, okay? Um, now, if you took this to the calculator, uh, you would see that the p-value is extremely small as expected uh, because of how far the test statistic is away from the critical value. And so again, this very small, literally minuscule p-value is supporting the critical value method in saying that this is a very conclusive test and rejecting the null hypothesis. Okay. <clears throat> so any questions how we conducted this test manually using the critical value method? All right, now how would we conduct this test using our calculator? Well, I'm going to show you now. So the p-value method, we all enjoy the p-value method because it's a lot quicker than the critical value method. So let's bring up our calculator and show ourselves how to do the chi-square test of independence. Well, uh... Okay, so what we need to do here, ladies and gentlemen, is we need to um, we need to go into our matrix mode. Above your um, on the left side of your keyboard here, above your recip X reciprocal button. This is called your X reciprocal button. Above that button in blue is the word matrix. To get into that mode, we therefore hit our second key followed by our X reciprocal key. That takes us into the matrix mode. So let's go ahead and do that. So therefore hitting the second button followed by the X reciprocal button, we get into the matrix mode. We have a names, math, and edit menu in the matrix environment. <clears throat> we need to go over to edit. <clears throat> now we're going to select matrix A. A matrix is nothing more than a column. A matrix is a column as a tape. I'm sorry. A matrix is like a table. It has rows and columns. Okay. Uh, has anybody ever worked with matrices? Maybe like in any algebra course. Matrices. Yep. Matrices are studied um, in college algebra here at Mock Community College, Math 130. Uh, matrices are also used in computer science. Um, when entering data into a computer, oftentimes arrays are used. They're called arrays. They're not called matrices in computer science. They're called arrays, A-R-R-A-Y. But arrays are the same thing as matrices in computer science. All right, anyways, let's go into matrix A by uh, diving in on the, we select edit matrix A, hit edit, enter. 
And now we need to configure how many rows by how many columns this matrix is to have. It's to be a two by three matrix. So two rows, enter, by three columns, enter. And when you configure your matrix to be a two by three matrix, notice your calculator allows for that to happen. It gives us six cells that need to be populated with the observed uh, frequencies. So the one one observed frequency is 100 from our contingency table. Enter. The one two observed frequency is 80. Enter. The one three observed frequency is 20. Enter. The 2 1 observed frequency is 50. The 2 2 observed frequency is 120. And the 2 3 observed frequency is 30. So now I've loaded up my 2 by 3 matrix with all my observed frequencies that we extracted from the contingency table of the data that we collected from the field. Now, ladies and gentlemen, what we're going to do is we're going to get out of this matrix mode, okay, by hitting second mode to quit. All right, and now we're going to go to stat, tests, scroll down, and last week it was the chi-square goodness of fit test. This week, today, is the chi-square test of independence. So this is the one we want. Does every one of our calculators out there have this test available? Um, I think they all do. Uh, if there was any question, it was last week with the goodness of fit test. Uh, but I think all the TI-84s have the chi-square uh, test of independence function. Even my old TI-83 calculator has this one. All right, hit enter to activate the test. Notice our observed frequencies are put into matrix A. Uh, do we all have matrix A showing here? Okay, suppose that we had a different matrix name here. Um, you know, like, if we had a different matrix name here, we would have to go back to our matrix mode. So second, X reciprocal button, and we would have to stay on names. And then we would have to just stay on names and then select the name of our matrix. Okay. So uh, my observed frequencies are a matrix A. So I have to go back and change it to matrix A. So here we go. Go back to matrix second X reciprocal. Stay on names and select matrix name A. And there we go. Notice your expected frequencies are automatically going to be computed behind the scenes very quickly. Those six expected frequencies and they're gonna be uh, thrown into matrix B. We're ready for the test. Just go down to calculate and here we go. Boom, the test has been done. Your test statistic is 26.6666667. The p-value is extremely small, 0.00001619596868. That's an extremely small p-value. Notice e to the negative six says that you would have to move your decimal point six places to the left, which means in decimal form, this is going to be point, there's five zeros, two, three, four, five, and then you finally get to one, six, one, nine, five. So that's a very small p-value to say the least. Uh, therefore, we are going to reject our null hypothesis and not even, not even worry or, or break a sweat in committing a type one error. That's such a small p-value. There's no risk whatsoever in rejecting your null hypothesis. Very conclusive test. All right. Did we all accomplish that on our calculator? Yep. So we know how to do this test manually and with the machine, correct? Okay. All right. Now, if you want to look at those six expected frequencies, you go back to matrix. Remember, they were put into matrix B. So if you go back to matrix second X reciprocal, go down to matrix name B and basically just hit enter. Hit enter again and you'll see those six expected frequencies that were computed. There's your expected frequencies. Notice those are the numbers inside the parentheses for each cell. 
that name. So your expected frequencies are automatically computed when you conduct this test and they're thrown into a matrix using matrix B there. Okay. All right, so we're good on that. Okay. All right, now this is a test for homogeneity of proportions. Uh, homogeneity is a word that says that if you have homogeneity of two or more proportions, essentially your proportions are equivalent to each other, okay? Uh, we can also use the chi-squared test and contingency tables to perform a test for homogeneity of proportions. This test, uh, the claim that different populations have the same proportion of subjects with a certain attitude or characteristic. We extract a sample from each of the several different populations, measure how many members of each population do and do not have the given characteristic of interest, and use these to uh, form our, our observed values. For example, 100 people in each of four different income groups are asked if they are very happy. The results are in the following contingency table. Uh, notice we have these columns where we have household income. Um, and the household income is in different, you know, categories of income, less than 30,000 a year. I believe this is annual income. 30 to 74,999, 75,000 all the way up to 999, and 100,000 or more. Um, these are the number of yes respondents and no respondents as to, you know, are you very happy with your life? Um, notice we have column totals and row totals here. And um, the idea here is to test and see if the proportion of people are who are very happy are the same for all the different uh, income categories here. So if P1, P2, P3, P4, are the proportions of each income group who answered yes, uh, then our hypotheses are the null hypothesis says that the proportion of people who are very happy are all equivalent to each other for the four different um, income groups versus the alternative hypothesis says at least one of the proportions is different, so they're not all equivalent. If the null hypothesis is true, then the cell values should be calculated using the formula. Uh, and these are the expected values again. Right, and that comes from the formula that we use to compute our expected frequencies uh, with the chi-square test of independence. So notice alongside of the observed frequencies, we have our expected frequencies inside parentheses for each cell. And then, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we would basically use the same uh, formula for the test statistic here. And notice the degrees of freedom is still the same. It's the number of rows minus one times the number of columns minus one. So that's going to be two minus one, two rows minus one times four rows minus one. That's going to give you degrees of freedom of three. So nothing changes between the expected frequencies and the test statistic between the chi-square test of independence and this chi-square test of multiple proportions from multiple um, populations. And you can see that our test statistic is 14.150. Uh, and our critical chi-square value is 7.815, which is obtained by using three degrees of freedom and uh, 0.05. So three degrees of freedom right here, 0.05, right here. 7.815 is the critical chi-square value. And uh, you can see that um, our test statistic falls very safely in the upper tail rejection region, which is saying that not all of these proportions are equivalent to each other.
So that would be the conclusion that not all of these uh, proportions are the same for the four different uh, income groups. So apparently, uh, sample evidence is strongly suggesting that uh, not everybody is very happy, you know, uh, between the four different income uh, groups here. And uh, gee, I wonder what group that is. That's not very happy. Uh, that's a tough one. But anyways, does that make sense there? Now, I, I did not put any problems on 11.2 homework or the 11, chapter 11 and 12 exam uh, regarding this test. I just thought I'd show you. It's a little extra for your money this afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. But the main uh, thrust in this section and accountability is the chi-square test of independence. Okay. But this is just something a little extra. Actually, this is foreshadowing what's to come in our last test on Wednesday. The, uh, the uh, analysis of variance test, which tests for the equivalence versus non-equivalence of two or more population means, and not proportions, but means. That's called the analysis of variance test on Wednesday in 12.1. That's the last thing that we will see in this course. All right. And this is just how to conduct the chi-square test of independence, uh, you know, using your calculator. I just showed you how to do that. And we're good on that. All right. Well, let's go to our textbook, see if we can have some fun here. This is 11 point, chapter 11.2. Test of independence. So this is 11.2. The sky chi-square test of independence here. There's your test statistic. And as always, you're welcome to look over the section. Uh, if you desire to do so. Uh, this is dive down to the homework problems down in here. Well, textbook problems at least. And uh, there's I'm going to, here we go. Number seven, problem number seven. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to go up here. And I am going to snip this right here and then bring it on down so we can see this here. This shows you how to compute your expected values that you need to compute your test statistic. Okay, let's go down to problem number seven now. I'll bring this up. All right, let's read problem number seven. It says, a recent study of 100 individuals found the following living arrangements for men and women. The results are shown. Check the data for the dependent relationship at 5%. Uh, men versus women. Uh, this is who they live with. Spouse, relative, non-relative, or live alone. So we're trying to test ladies, I'm two categorical variables for dependence versus independency here. Uh, one categorical variable is gender. The other categorical variable is who do you live with? Spouse, relative, non-relative, or alone. We're going to test to see if these two variables are dependent or independent of one another. Okay. So in other words, is there an independency or dependency as to you know who we live with and our gender. We're gonna test that, chi-square test of independence. I want you to do this test two different ways. The critical value method, where you have to compute these uh, expected frequencies here. It looks like there's gonna be, what, eight of them, right? Two rows by four columns. And then you have to compute your test statistic value. Do the test manually. And then I want you to use your calculator to conduct this test using the p-value method. So two different methods, and of course, they obviously have to cooperate with one another as far as the conclusion is concerned. So there you go. I'll give you time to work on this problem. Number seven, the chi-square test of independence. Do the problem critical value method-wise and also p-value method-wise. That'll be classwork number one there, number seven there.
Okay, let's take a look at number seven here. Um, the null hypothesis would be saying that the living arrangement and gender are independent uh, variables. The alternative hypothesis would state that the living arrangement and gender are dependent variables. Testing at 5%, uh, we're going to take R minus 1 times C minus 1, or uh, 2 rows minus 1 times 4 columns minus 1, or 3 degrees of freedom, to our um, chi-square table uh, to find the critical chi-square value. Uh, this is your 2 by 3, 2 by 4 contingency table, the observed frequencies. And then I computed the 8 expected frequencies here. Again, to compute expected frequency, you take the row, row times the column total divided by the grand total. Okay. Uh, so. All right. And so I put my expected frequencies inside the parentheses here. And um, now the test statistic can be computed. And the test statistic is going to be taking the difference between the observed frequency and the expected frequency divided by the expected frequency, and we square those differences. Um, so 8 minus this squared divided by the expected frequency is 6.5 plus, and I do that for each of the eight cells here. When all is said and done, your test statistic walks out with a value of about 1.674. And now we need to um, find our critical chi-square value with three degrees of freedom and 5% level of significance in the upper tail rejection region. So this is what the chi-square distribution looks like. Our critical chi-square value from the table in the back of your book, appendix table A-6. Gives you 7.815 for the critical chi-square value. You can see that the test statistic falls very, very safely in the do not reject region. And therefore, ladies and gentlemen, we cannot reject the null hypothesis here. And therefore, we must state that um, living arrangements and gender appear to be independent of one another. So there does not appear to be any dependency upon living arrangement and your gender. The p-value method came up with a p-value of 0 0.643, which is an extremely large p-value. Uh, the only way you can reject the null hypothesis is to drive alpha's value up to at least about 65% or higher. But then you stand a whopping 65% or higher chance of committing a type 1 error or rejecting a null hypothesis that is, in fact, probably true. Way too much risk here to even think about rejecting the null hypothesis. So clearly, we do not reject the null hypothesis here. Did anybody come up with this same conclusion here? Any same numbers? Yep. Did anybody get this? Are we getting this, lady? This is the critical value method, OK? You can see how tedious this chi-square test of independence is. And in two days, our last test, the analysis of variance test, is equally uh, tedious. And for that reason, it is nice to know that we can conduct this test using our calculator to speed things up. Okay, so um, again, how did we use our calculator to conduct this test? Well, I went to my matrix mode, second X reciprocal button, whoops, second X reciprocal button. I went, in, I went to edit. Matrix A, configured it as a two by four matrix and entered in my observed frequencies. Then when I did that, I got out of this. Then I went to stat, test, scrolled down to the chi-square test of independence. My observed frequencies are in matrix A. The expected frequencies will be poured into matrix B. Go to calculate. And you can see that the p-value is very large, 0.64, and there's your test statistic value. So this p-value is much too large to reject the null hypothesis. If you want to look at your expected frequencies that were computed, you go back to matrix, stay on names, and go down to matrix name B, hit enter. 
hit enter again, and there's your eight expected frequencies that were computed. So that's how we do the test, both manually and with the computer, okay? And you can see that this, um, this calculator would become even more desirable if you had, could you imagine having uh, 10 rows by 10 columns in conducting this test, 100 cells to compute 100 expected frequencies. You imagine how long that problem would take you. Uh, all the more reason why you definitely want to turn a problem of that size uh, over to a calculator or computer system, okay? These are small problems here, but oftentimes this chi-square test of independence can get into very large contingency tables, uh, maybe even hundreds of rows and hundreds of columns, which would be um, impossible to do humanly uh, speaking uh, without making a mistake, okay? So you need a computer system for the large problems. All right. So does that problem make any sense there? All right, ladies and gentlemen, this next problem, number eight. Now, for problem number eight, uh, you do not have to uh, do the problem using the critical value method. Uh, I will allow you to use the p-value method to conduct this problem. I still want you to write down clearly what the hypotheses are that you're testing. Then I want you to indicate what the p-value is and then your conclusion in plain English. Okay, so go ahead and do this problem using the p-value method. We'll call this classwork number two. P-value method only, not the critical value method. All right, go ahead and do that.
All right, so uh, these are the hypotheses that you'll be testing, that accidents and gender are independent versus they are dependent. And I just wanted you to conduct the p-value method, so let's go ahead and do that quickly here. Go into matrix mode, go to edit, matrix name A, configure that to be a two by, uh, two by four again. Enter in the expected, uh, excuse me, the observed frequencies from the table. All right, so those are your observed frequencies thrown in your two by four matrix there. And now we're going to conduct a chi square, chi square test of independence here. So go to stat, test, go grab the chi square test. And your p value is extremely large. Uh, 0.877. There's no way you can reject the null hypothesis here. Way too much risk of committing a type one error. So therefore, ladies and gentlemen, we we do not reject the null hypothesis, and therefore we will conclude that what it appears that gender and accidents are dependent upon one another. There is a dependency that exists between accidents and the gender of a person. That's what this test is telling us. Did anybody get that conclusion there? Get that uh, p-value there? <clears throat> yep. All right. So these are interesting investigations here. There's a lot of interesting problems uh, in here. Uh, let's see here. Uh, here's an interesting one uh, involving... Uh, Let's see here. Uh, organ transplants here. Listed number 16. Listed is information regarding organ transplantation for three different years. Based on this data, is there sufficient evidence at the 1% level of significance to conclude that a relationship exists between year and type of transplant? Uh, go ahead and do that problem. Call that classwork three. You can just use the p-value method. You don't have to use the long, laborious critical value method for doing this problem. Go ahead and do that one. We'll call that classwork number three here, okay? Number 16. Again, state the hypotheses. Make sure you always write down the hypotheses you're testing. And your, your conclusion, please do write a simple, uh, plain English conclusion that like a 12-year-old could understand, even if they don't know anything about statistics. That's very important to be able to do that. All right, go ahead and do number 16.
All right, so for number 16, these will be the hypotheses we're testing. And all hypotheses as a year and a type of tra organ transplant are independent of one another. Whereas the alternative hypothesis says that the year and the type of organ transplant are dependent. Okay. And so we'll just conduct a um, p value test uh, for this. So we bring up our calculator here. Go to matrix. Select matrix A. Wrong. Go to matrix. Go to edit. Then matrix A. All right, this is going to be, they'll notice there's three years, uh, one, two, three by three different types of uh, uh, organ transplants. So this is a three by three contingency table here. So now we type in the observed frequencies. All right, loaded up with the observed frequencies, and now we can conduct a uh, the chi-square test of independence. Uh, go to stat, test, go down and grab the chi-square test of independence. Observed frequencies in A, expected frequencies in B. Calculate, and there we go. Uh, what do you think? P-value, is that a large or small P-value? Small. Very, very small. So what would we conclude in plain English? Very small p-value. So what are we going to conclude? That there is a relationship between the year and the type of organ transplanted. That's what it looks like. Yeah. So there is uh, some sort of a relationship or dependency upon the year and the type of organ transplant. All right. Now, I just want to show ourselves one more problem here. Like I said, I did not put this type of problem on the 11.2 homework or the exam, but it would be a good way to close out this section here. Uh, I'll walk through the problem. You don't have to uh, include this in your uh, classwork here. But uh, let's just try one of these uh, uh, tests for uh, homogeneity between proportions. Number 26 is an interesting um, investigation here. Uh, a psychology professor wishes to see if the proportion of men and women who visit TikTok daily are the same. The professor randomly selects 50 people from each group to see how many are men and how many are women who use TikTok. The data are shown, and they want us to test at 5% to see uh, if you know the proportion of men and women uh, who visit TikTok several times a day, once a day, or less often are the same or not the same. Okay, so what hypotheses would we be testing here? Well, for number 26, we're testing again to see if the proportion of men and women <clears throat> are the same uh, for each of these three categories, several times a day, uh, visiting TikTok once a day or less often. And so the hypotheses we'll be testing uh, will be saying this, that the proportion of men and women who visit, um, well, what is it again? Who visit several times a day, is equal to the proportion of men and women who visit TikTok once a day, is equal to the proportion of men and women who visit TikTok less often. as opposed to the alternative hypothesis says that not all of these proportions are equivalent. All 
All right, and to conduct this test is pretty simple. We would conduct it the same way as we conduct a chi-square test of independence. There's no difference. It's an amazing thing. Um, so we bring up our calculator. And I guess I have to put it over here. So I'll go to matrix, edit. All right, so we have uh, two rows uh, versus three columns here. So two by three. And we type in the observed frequencies. All right, and we're ready to roll here. So we go to stat, test, sky square test of independence. And there you go, we got a p-value is about 37%. So that p-value is large, uh, therefore we will not reject the null hypothesis. And therefore, what would we conclude in plain English? We're not going to reject the null hypothesis. So therefore, we would conclude that it looks like that the proportion of men and women who visit TikTok uh, during these three different uh, frequency levels um, are about the same. All right? In other words, there does not appear to be any difference in the proportion of men and women who visit TikTok several times a day, once a day, or less often. That's what the test has shown us. That makes sense, sir? All right. So today, what we accomplished is we looked at the chi-square test of independence. We conducted this test uh, on one problem using the critical value method, and that was more than enough to show us how tedious this problem was to do manually. And then we turned it over to the calculator for the remaining uh, examples using the p-value method. And I showed you one example of testing for several population proportions for equivalence versus non-equivalence. And in two days, to wrap up this course, we'll look at uh, how to test for the equivalence of two or more population means versus not all the population means are equivalent. That's called analysis of variance. Okay. And um, so now, again, a reminder, I did not put... Uh, any of these, like number 26 with problems on your 11 2 homework or the chapter 11 12 exam. So, like I said, ladies and gentlemen, you have everything. If you want to work ahead, you can go ahead and do so. You can look at the PowerPoint presentation over 12.1 on the analysis of variance. And if you feel you can basically teach yourself that method, go for it. You know, you can finish the class early. If not, you want to wait for my lecture on Wednesday, my last lecture on the analysis of variance on 12.1. I'll, I'll see you then. Uh, but if you don't have any questions or comments, I'll hopefully see you in a, uh, hopefully we'll wrap up this course in good fashion. Um, I'll be on the line for a couple of minutes. I think there was one student I talked to, but uh, have a good day, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, just remember to do the homework before the quiz, before the exam. Always do it in that order. And that's about, about it. Okay. All right. So have a nice day. <laughs>